This is the McKinsey Podcast, where we help you make sense out of our world's toughest business challenges. Welcome to the show. I'm Lucia Riley. And I'm Roberta Fasaro. I think that one of the real core tenets of apprenticeship for us is that it is non-hierarchical that it doesn't have to be the most senior person apprenticing the most junior person. It should be the person who has the skills and whoever that person is, they should feel the responsibility and the obligation and the opportunity of helping other people get the same skills that they have. That's Lisa Christensen, a director of learning at McKinsey. She joins me and McKinsey partner, Tony Gamble, to talk about apprenticeship. It's an old concept that needs to play a new role in the development of today's talent. After McKinsey senior partner Rob Palter shares a lesson he learned early in his career when confronted with a client's bad idea. It's from our Rookie Moment series. Lisa, Tony, thanks for joining the podcast today. Great to be here. Thank you for having us. It's good to be here. All right. So we're here to talk about apprenticeship. When I think of the term, I think of my uncle in Italy who apprenticed with a tailor and then opened up his own shop. How do you both define apprenticeship? So when I think of apprenticeship, I really think about a teacher-learner relationship that happens in the flow of work. So there is somebody who has skills and they are teaching somebody else those skills and helping them move towards greater independence. That's how we know apprenticeship is working, is somebody is able to start doing things more and more independently, more and more on their own. And, and apprenticeship is really an opportunity for us to transfer expertise from somebody who really knows how to do something to somebody who's just learning. Yeah, to build on that, there is a lot of the concepts of apprenticeship that that is unchanged, and that is around skill transfer from an expert to a novice. And I think that the the biggest realization that we're finding these days is that in the world of knowledge working or a place where expertise is cognitive as opposed to physical, we just have to think about it differently. And we have to act differently and speak differently and use a different different skill set to be able to transfer knowledge and, and skills more efficiently. So how does apprenticeship differ from other uh, maybe teaching and learning models that folks in, in businesses today are more familiar with? Things like mentorship, sponsorship, coaching. All of those things have an important place in, in today's workplace. Mentorship is important because from mentors, you get advice and direction. They can help you think about what you should be doing. Uh, from sponsors, you get real opportunities. Somebody who can create new opportunities for you to lead or, or work in different ways that you have not before. But from, a, from an apprenticeship relationship, you really get skills. And so we do think that there is a difference between those three different kinds of relationships. All are important, but that apprenticeship comes with a set of kind of techniques and, and things that you can do as an expert to grow skills and people around you um, that are a little bit different than just giving them advice or even trying to create opportunities for them. There's some really specific things that help grow skills in other people. Yeah, Lisa, I like how you define those and the differences between mentorship, sponsorship, and apprenticeship. And one thing I'd, I'd say I've come to really believe is that apprenticeship is not a selective commitment and that if we are leaders, we have a responsibility to grow the skills of the people in our, in our organizations. And whereas you might choose a mentor or choose someone to mentor or, or the same around sponsorship, apprenticeship is, is truly deep down. It's a, it's a commitment. It's an obligation that we should all embrace. And I've actually heard you say before something that's really interesting, uh, which I wrote down and I, I think about in my regular work, right? Which is when someone's on my watch, my job is to help make them better. My job is to look around me and say, what skills do I possess and how can I help transfer those to other people? And I love the idea that that for leaders is an obligation and something that we should all be doing. So what skills are required in order to, for an apprenticeship relationship to succeed? So the research tells us there's really four techniques that make up the skill set of apprenticeship, modeling, scaffolding, coaching, and fading. And just the, at a high level, here's what those things mean. M modeling is my ability to show you what I know and help you understand the rationale behind it. 
Scaffolding is the kind of supports that I create around you that can look like anything. That could be a document that I give you. That could be a YouTube video I send you to look at. That could be me talking to you or coaching you in a situation. Um, But I provide support to help you do the work. Coaching is the feedback, the pointers, the tips, the things that I do to help you as you are doing that work and you're acting. So it's you do it and I give you lots of rich feedback so that you can get better at it. And fading is knowing when to pull back. As you start to get better and better, I am able to remove some of the training wheels that I'm providing for you and you're able to act with with increasing independence. Look, one of the, the biggest insights for me around cognitive apprenticeship is the notion of scaffolding. Scaffolding as a as a method or a, a language to be able to, to make your invisible insights visible. There was a time when I had to visit something like four factories in a week and there was no way I could physically do it. And so some of my colleagues uh, had, to, had to go look at some other factories while I was looking at one or two of them. And so I created a template of the way I look at factories. And here are the questions that I ask and here are the things I look for. And here's the output that I, that I typically present at, at, after doing a, a one day factory walkthrough. And I found it was quite effective to be able to not only uh, get to a good output for my clients, but it actually upskilled the people that I was working with on how I think about, about, about factory walkthroughs. And so in doing so, that what I was doing there was scaffolding. I was creating a construct, a mental construct for other people in the organization to use when looking at a similar problem. And does it always have to be a top-down model when we're talking about apprenticeship? Is it always a senior person transferring skills to a junior person or can it go the other way? I think it should go the other way, right? I, I think that one of the, the real core tenets of apprenticeship for us is that it is non-hierarchical, that it doesn't have to be the most senior person apprenticing the most junior person. That certainly happens. And in the conversation we have today, we might even kind of default to describing it that way, but it doesn't have to be that way. It should be the person who has the skills and whoever that person is, they should feel the responsibility and the obligation and the opportunity of helping other people get the same skills that they have. As the problems that we're solving in in the world today become more and more complex, it's it's just really valuable to have different you know diversity in problem solving and different perspectives. And so, oftentimes, even just the the interaction of of di- people of different tenures and different backgrounds and, and different expertise really does help you get to a better answer. And oftentimes, the the most amazing insight will come from a, a pair of fresh eyes who are brand new to the organization who just have a different way of looking at things. So this calls to mind this notion of, you know, multi-generational workforces. Is there a generational component to apprenticeship that leaders need to think about if you're if you're trying to build um, more apprenticing into your organization? I'm I'm not sure how much generational differences are playing into it, other than one thing really does come to mind, which is that we live in an era now where information is much more accessible than it has ever been before. I'm not actually as dependent on the people around me to teach me. I can learn in lots of different ways. And in the work I do in learning for a long time, there is this concern about like, well, how do we get them to stop searching for things and come to us instead? And I, I think that's the wrong question, actually. So, you know, if you're if people are Googling for great information or they're watching YouTube videos for great information, wherever they're finding it, how do we start to think about also bringing experts and expertise and apprenticeship into that ecosystem so that people aren't out searching on their own, but that it's part of a full experience that they're getting? They're, they're looking for information wherever they find it. And also they are getting to learn from experts and people who do something really well. I do want to talk about ways to encourage more apprenticeship and build apprenticeship programs. But one question about what prevents leaders from doing it? What are, what are some of the obstacles to, uh, to engaging in apprenticeship in organizations today? So I think there are three things that I've seen that have, um, uh, that you could see as, as, as obstacles or unlocks, uh, depending on which way you look at them. But uh, first is just having a good mindset 
around uh, around apprenticeship. Second is having the skill set or the, the language to talk about apprenticeship. And, and third is to create the space for it. And maybe I'll even just start with talking about one of the mindsets, and that's a mindset of in- intentionality. This came really clear to me last year when we were piloting concepts of uh, cognitive apprenticeship with about 180 of our colleagues uh, globally. And after three months, we found that 80% of participants experienced better apprenticeship relationships. Now, you might skeptically look at that stat and say, of course, those 180 people self-selected into a pilot on apprenticeship. Uh, why would we be surprised if they had shown better apprenticeship? And I raise that because that's kind of the point. If you make an intentional step towards improving apprenticeship, uh, we're finding that is that is one of the, the first steps you need to make to to improve on this on this new skill set. So when I think about intentionality, it's acting with purpose, right? I'm the things I do, the choices I make, the ways that I interact with you. I'm making those choices quite purposefully. So I think about um, an example, maybe you get a deliverable and it's not what you want it to be. And so you change it and make it right, right? Nobody can learn anything from that. But if you sit with somebody and you say, here are the 10 comments that I made on your on this deliverable. Let's talk through them. Let's go into this thing that I need you to do differently. Let's talk about why this matters. If you start to model the thinking, right? That deliverable is going to get produced one way or another. It can either become a tool for learning or it can be a missed opportunity. And so for me, part of what we're describing is intentionality is our making purposeful choices about using the work to further other people's skills. When you talk about better apprenticeship, what are some of the discrete outcomes? What are the metrics that you use? Is it, is it about the, the nature of the relationships or the, the nature of the outcomes or the, or the deliverables, so to speak? At the end of the day, it comes down to uh, growth and learning. And I think maybe the, I'll highlight one insight that I think is the, the real unlock, and that is the idea in cognitive apprenticeship, the insights are invisible. Um, they're in your head. And so um, an expert has a mental model on how they see the world and a novice or a learner is, is trying to learn that mental model. And so to me, the, the metric of success is to the extent to which the learner has adopted a new mental model. Not that they've reflected feedback, not that they've changed something in an, in, a, in an output of work, but that they've changed their mental model so that when they see a situation later, independent of the expert, they will be better skilled and better able to address that same situation. I, I like that idea of invisible insights. I think that's critical to the work, actually, because so much of the work that we do in our environments is not work that you can observe, even what we're doing right now. Right? You you might be able to observe us recording this podcast, but the work is actually happening in my mind. And so I need to get a lot better if I'm going to help other people grow their skills at being able to give voice to that cognition. I have to be able to talk about my thinking. I have to be able to model it for other people. And it is through that modeling that I start to build their skills because the work is so heavily cognitive now, you know, sitting in a meeting and managing stakeholders, thinking about how you build deliverables or what somebody will need to see in a presentation or hear in a conversation. That work is all deeply cognitive. You can't see it. And so the idea of embracing apprenticeship techniques that help you model those invisible insights is a really important differentiator in this work and in the skills to becoming a great uh, apprentice or I guess someone who apprentices others. Well, Lisa, the the one thing I, I just thought of when you were saying that too, is we've learned more and more that the deeper you are an expert in something, the harder it will be for you to explain your mental model. And that's, that's made me really think about expertise in a different way, and the value of an expert in an organization um, relative to the work that we're, they're doing, and so I think that's going to be one of the biggest organizational challenges we have in the future is is finding ways to encourage and incentivize and, and help experts to train communities of expertise within companies so that their knowledge becomes institutional knowledge. I mean, the value of the expert is amazing, 
but that value is is multiplied much greater if they're able to share their mental model with a whole community of people in their companies. How do we think about apprenticeship differently in today's work environment? I mean, we're not co-located, right? And as much as the information is in my brain, sometimes it's easier if you and I are sitting side by side and I'm explaining how I'm using this microphone and what pages I'm looking at. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just curious to get your thoughts about how we should think about apprenticeship differently post COVID and, you know, into, into our hybrid uh, working models right now. A good question, Roberto, and one that we've been talking about a lot uh, internally. So a couple of reactions. One is first, the research does tell us that apprenticeship has relied on informal collision moments in the past. And those are unplanned moments when uh, two coworkers so to speak, collide or find time to connect, uh, whether it's following a meeting or um, over a cup of coffee. I think something like greater than 80% of apprenticeship was happening in these unplanned moments. So the insights from that for me are um, that when you're in a remote world, those physical collision moments just don't happen. And so, which again, brings me back to the the point about intentionality is that you can create those moments um, if you think, if you're a bit more thoughtful about how you um, manage your calendar and, and find time to connect with people. Um, second, I think it's also important for us to continue to look for techno- you know, technology ways or other ways to, to work collaboratively with people, even when in remote situations. And it's, it's just simply that the, the fact that you're doing work together is that you will learn from each other. I think one of the things that we are excited about is the idea that we might actually be able to start to get greater scale in, a, in an organization if people's skills are stronger and they're less dependent on those collision moments. If that's what you think apprenticeship is, if you think it's the car ride to the airport or the walk back to your office after a meeting, then your view is limited in what you can do. You do have to create some space in a remote environment that you wouldn't probably otherwise have to create. But it's really a lot more about skill and your ability to grow the skills of others than it is about a moment that happens. Can you give us an example of how a manager and a team member can incorporate apprenticeship into their process? Let's take an example where a worker has sent a presentation or a document to a manager in preparation for a meeting the following day. And the manager looks at it. I'll pretend I'm the manager. I'll look at it and I'll I'll, I'll see that there are a lot of changes that need to be made before the meeting tomorrow. And in my haste, I may uh, look at it and say, look, I know exactly what needs to be done. I'm just going to make all the changes myself. And because it's going to be a lot easier, I know what I'm looking for and I have the expertise uh, and it'll just take take much less time. Now that's a common practice or perceive as a common practice um, that taking the path of least resistance will get you to a good answer for the next day. But what I will miss out on is the, the opportunity to apprentice and teach the person that's on my team. So alternatively, what I could do is pick up the phone and and talk through the document with, with the person on my team, walking through all the changes that I was going to make myself individually, but do them with the coworker, um, explaining why along the way. And, and the why, you know, might be as simple as, you know, I, I prefer this word choice or I prefer this way of telling a story that's more direct as opposed to indirect. Or it might even be the formatting of the page and that, that really matters. Um, in in the feedback that I'm giving. In the end, if I'm going to do the work anyway, why not do the work in a way that develops a person on my team so that they will grow their skills independently? And so next time they send a document or prepare for the same sort of meeting, they've they've advanced their skills and and they're they're much more capable of, of doing what we've asked, what we're looking for them to do. If we're deliberate and we take the time up front, it will save time. It will. It will. And actually, I think that's one of the biggest concerns that we hear in our work right now is I don't have time to do this. It will pay off in the long run, both for you and for them. Here's one more example. In in a remote world, I'm starting to see that a lot of us are doing our work independently and sequentially as opposed to uh, working together collaboratively as we would do if we were sitting in the room with each other. And so what I've started doing, and I encourage other people to do this as well, is even in a Zoom world, if you're going to have a meeting one-on-one with someone, to bring along someone from your team 
who can join the meeting, observe, listen, and apprentice with you. And, and even in those small instances, built up over time, your team will grow and, and you'll grow together as well. It's about providing people exposure to lots of different situations in which they can practice, right? So that it's not just theoretical, but it's, it's all of these instances where you're actually doing work together. So I wanted to dive in a little bit on the actual apprenticeship relationship. In that relationship, does enthusiasm matter more than experience when it comes to building a successful apprenticing relationship? Certainly we want people who have deep, rich skills in an organization to be apprenticing others. But also, if you're really excited about teaching what you know to other people, I think that we collectively believe you should take the liberty to do that. There's something implicit in this question about what if we teach somebody wrong? And I understand that concern. And also, if apprenticeship is a rich environment inside an organization, I'm not just learning from Tony. I'm not just learning from you. I'm learning from everybody around me. I'm not trying to create somebody who's exactly like me. I'm trying to create really great designers or I'm trying to create really great leaders. They don't all have to be exactly like me. And so I hope they're all learning from each other. I think it's both, right? And I think it's, I think it's license and liberty to feel like you can grow other people's skills and that, and that you should be doing that. Look, I'd, I'd say I um, you know, 90% agree with you on that. I think there's an age-old debate about whether you hire for skill or hire for will. And I think you're right. You're looking for both. You are looking for both. But at the end of the day, I am more and more convinced that that you can you can hire for will and, and, and train for skill. And if someone has the enthusiasm to learn and you as an organization have an enthusiasm to teach, um, then you have a commitment to each other that, that that's that's the type of um, formula that's really going to be successful. Lisa, you mentioned this notion that you, you don't want to learn from people who are exactly like yourself. How do you avoid the mini-me bias? I think that that's a really important thing to think about. I know um, for me, when in the team that I lead, there is somebody on my team and I really enjoy working with him. I really enjoy apprenticing him because he is exactly like me. He thinks the same way I think. And so in those, com those conversations just feel very easy and they gel. And part of my obligation as a leader is then to look around and say, okay, I certainly should spend time with him and work and help build his skills. But I can't only spend time with him. I have to find opportunities for everybody on the team. I have to work with everybody on the team. I have to try to build the skill set of everybody on the team. I'm trying to create excellent designers or I'm trying to create excellent whatevers. And they don't all need to be exactly like me. And so that really trying to intentionally avoid that mini me bias and having awareness that that's a possibility, I think is a really important first step in, in kind of getting to, to an answer to your question. And I think there's a there's another bonus benefit that comes from, from avoiding the mini me uh, mindset. And that's sometimes the expert needs a different point of view to continue learning themselves. And experts have blind spots too. So my, my deep expertise, I, I'm, I'm a manufacturing expert. And so uh, I've been in over 200 factories. And so I, I credit myself in being able to read a factory pretty quickly. But a couple of years ago, I, I brought along with me a colleague who really had no background in manufacturing, but was super deep in, in corporate finance. And after we walked through the factory, we both compared notes and, and I, I shared you know, the different levers that you could pull to improve the productivity and improve the throughput, improve the quality. And uh, the, the colleague I was working with stopped and said, yeah, Tony, I, I see you could do all those things, but I don't think this factory is making any money, or, nor do I think it's structurally ever able to make any money. And he kind of did the back of the envelope math on, on a, and to, to show me that, that and, and he was right. Actually, the, the, the factory was structurally um, uh, unprofitable. And I, I didn't have that lens to look at this. I was coming to it with my, you know, pattern recognition and my, my well-refined well expert lens of how do you fix a factory? And so for me, again, I think having a diverse view, viewpoint um, is, it just creates another situation of learning for, for the expert as well. So in the end, not only did I as a leader or expert learn a new way to look at a problem, 
but we actually solved the problem in a better way. We got to a better answer. And I think we need to be open to the, the idea that leaders, if we are open to different perspectives, we will get to better answers. I like that so much. And, and I think it reinforces something that, again, we keep saying, but is really important, is that this has to become an ecosystem where everybody is learning and everybody is teaching. And we're doing that all the time for one another. I'm curious how the apprentice relationship changes over time. I mean, both sides are going to experience different things and share different experiences and inputs and successes and failures. So how do we think about um, maintaining these relationships over time? Actually, one of the important techniques that we are trying to teach folks is the ability to fade, is the ability to kind of uh, dial down their support as somebody's skills increase. So as you see somebody's independence increasing, they're doing the work on their own. They're much more effective on their own. It's okay to fade back. So an apprenticeship relationship might be for a season. It might be for a specific skill. It might be for a specific moment, or it might last for a really long time, but the relationship is quite fluid and knowing how to dial up or down your support as the expert is an important part of the skill of apprenticing others. But if you're talking about expertise apprenticeship, the arc of learning is much longer. It could be years or even decades as you're becoming much more deep in your own knowledge about a certain topic. And then when you're talking about expertise apprenticeship, then I think you need to be much more deliberate about choosing who your teachers are, because those are the people you want to breathe into shaping who you are most. That gives me one other thought, actually, that kind of circles back to something we talked about at the beginning, which is that there is a distinction between apprenticeship and mentorship. And and some of those people might overlap for you. I think it's important to be a bit more explicit about the types of relationships you have with different people. You might stay connected to somebody for a really long time as a great mentor, and sometimes you'll apprentice with them a little bit, and sometimes you might apprentice less. And so both of those things can be true in the same moment. Lisa and Tony, how can organizations use apprenticeships to begin to reshape their cultures around this idea of continuous learning? I think there's a couple of important things. So creating an organizational expectation that everybody learns and everybody teaches is where is the first thing for me. And then I think the second thing is making sure that everybody has the skills to apprentice one another. I think those are great, Lisa. Let me pile on with two two practices or habits that I think have made this come, come to life for me. Uh, first is just around, and I said this before, about creating space for apprenticeship. And that's, again, having a mindset of intentionality and looking for windows of time throughout the day that you can stop and have moments of apprenticeship with people on your team. Um, or if you're the learner, that you, you, you deliberately pause and ask someone why they acted the way they did or if they can explain what they said and what was behind it. I think the second thing is... There's a difference between giving feedback and giving development-oriented feedback. And the difference just comes down to the words we use. And I think if we're all a little bit more caring and thoughtful in the words we're using when providing feedback to each other, that it takes a normal feedback situation and turns it into an opportunity for learning. I can say um, either you know, change these words or let, write this sentence instead. And then if I just pause for a moment and say, because this will get us to a better outcome, because the person you're writing to is going to be sensitive about what you just wrote here. So we need to write it differently. You know, that explanation alone explains why I'm giving the feedback and is developmental in nature. And the person I'm talking to will be better for it going forward. This has been a great conversation. I know I've learned a lot. Lisa, Tony, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, Roberta. It's been great. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. And now let's hear from senior partner Rob Palter, who early on in his career at McKinsey learned a big lesson from his manager about how to handle a client who would not take no for an answer. So the first time I had a difficult conversation with a client, I was leading this engagement where I was helping a client assess a potential acquisition. And We'd been working confidentially with the CEO alone because it was a high profile transaction 
And after about five weeks, the team had come to the view that this probably was not the smartest or most attractive investment that this client could do. So we took our analysis and we wrote a very detailed memo with all the backup work. And I sent it to the CEO and scheduled a meeting to brief him on our findings. And in advance of the scheduled meeting, the CEO called my office, found my assistant and said, wherever Rob Palter is, you find him and you tell him to come down to my office immediately. I need to speak to him. So I obviously was a young, a young project leader. I was very nervous. So I quickly hopped in the cab and I ran down to the client's office and I walked into his office and he said, I've received your memo and I've received your analysis where you concluded that this was not an attractive transaction for us to do. I want you to know that I vehemently disagree with you and that you will change this memo and you will write a memo to me saying that McKinsey wholeheartedly supports this transaction and thinks that it's an excellent thing for this organization to do. And if you do not write that memo, I won't pay your fees. And I was petrified. So I walked out of the CEO's office and I called the senior partner uh, who was working with me and I told him what had transpired. And the senior partner looked at me and he said, Rob, do you believe in your analysis? And I said, yes, absolutely I believe in the analysis. He said, Rob, do you believe that it's the wrong thing for this client to do? And I said, yes, I do believe it's the wrong thing for this client to do. He said, great. He said, let's get together tonight Let's spend an extra hour or two going through all the work to make sure that I agree and you agree and the entire team agrees. Let's bring in somebody from outside our team to look at our work and see if they agree with our conclusions. And if the conclusion is that we stand behind our work, then we stand behind our work. We went through every page as a team, every analysis, every model, read the memo, checked the conclusions. So I said to the senior partner, well, what do we do about the threat about not paying us our fees? And he looked at me and he said, we have a professional obligation to be objective and independent. And if you and we, which we do objectively and independently conclude that this is not the right thing for the client, then we need to stand behind our work and tell the client that. And if we remain with our fees unpaid, so be it. So I called up the CEO the next day and I said, look, we've done a thorough review. We're not changing our position. And if you choose not to pay us and you choose not to work with us again, so be it. And the CEO said, that's fine. We're not working together again and I'm not paying you. And I said, okay. The CEO subsequently went on to do the transaction. The transaction did not work out well and it ended that CEO's career. And unfortunately, you know, we no longer work with that client. And unfortunately it didn't, it didn't work out for anyone, but at least we were objective and independent. Thanks so much for listening to the McKinsey Podcast. I'm Lucia Rahilly. And I'm Roberta Fasaro. Find us on McKinsey.com. We'll have a transcript of this episode up shortly. And check out the McKinsey Insights app where you can find this podcast and other helpful content updated daily. And if you would, we'd love for you to leave a rating and a review. We'll see you in two weeks.